Thank you for downloading this podcast from Emmanuel Church Lurgan. At Emmanuel, our vision is to help rewrite the story of Craigavon, Ireland and the nations with the good news of the Kingdom of God. We hope you enjoy listening to this message. Thank you for downloading this podcast from Emmanuel Church Lurgan. At Emmanuel, our vision is to help rewrite the story of Craigavon, Ireland and the nations with the good news of the Kingdom of God. We hope you enjoy listening to this message. I want to talk to you um, over the next number of weeks. Steve and I are going to um, sort of come together and talk to you about this word, listen. We sent God really speak to us about um, the ability to listen to God, listen to the truths of God some of the elementary and fundamental truths of Scripture that are um, so powerful. Like when, you know, when you'd say in your house, shh, shh. Oftentimes we don't stay quiet for very long, should we? Don't? We... Um, and, and I love this verse. I love Psalm 116. It says, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. So God listens to us because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. And that little word inclined um, means, um, if the NLT puts it, he bends down to listen. And it has the connotation of a forward lean. If you have been talking to somebody and there's a little bit of background noise and you lean forward to listen to them. That's what that word means. God actually bends down to listen to us. So if he has listened to us, the least we could do is listen to him. And some of our conversations with God are one way. That's the problem with Christian life is it's like, you, you, you give God your list, you talk to him, but very seldom do you ever set a space in your day where you actually listen to him. And we live in one of the loudest, noisiest ages to date. Opinions, millions of them at the touch of a button. Um, everyone wants their voice to be heard and everyone thinks they're right and because they're right, everyone else is probably wrong. That's the tune of the day. Um, so I'm, my question to you this morning is, when was the last time you were silent? When, or better still, when was the last time you sat and listened to the silence? We were uh, in the Holy Land with Mo and um, many others uh, back in uh, last year. And we went out on the Sunday morning onto the, the Sea of Galilee, out in a boat, and we motored out into the middle of the Sea of Galilee. And then the guy just cut the engine. And we sat on a beautiful Sunday morning, our first day there, in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. And the silence was deafening. The silence was deafening. Because all around, everything was shouting at you at creation. Jesus was here. Jesus sat in a boat in this lake. All of these things were going on. And so we don't actually listen sometimes. People talked in the early days of lockdown that they seemed to notice the birds um, sing louder or at least they noticed them more. But um, the problem is the, the rush has crept back into life again. And we said that wasn't going to happen, but for some of you in the room, it has. And the rush has crept in. And so just across from my, sorry, it's a bit wonky, but I took this photograph from my desk, all right? So sitting at my desk at home in my study, this is in the wall in front of me, hangs in the wall in front of me. Let's be silent so we can hear the whisper of God. And this is a timely reminder for me every day that there is silence needed for my soul. Now, by um, default, I'm an introvert, so silence is a good thing for me. For some of you, that maybe is not. But um, so, so when, when, when we go to the very last book of the Bible, it's called the book of Revelation. Now, it's a revelation of Jesus Christ, and it was given to the apostle John on the island of Patmos. The island of Patmos was the place where the Romans actually put you as an outcast to die, really. And so John's exiled on an island 
And God gives him this special revelation of himself. Jesus gives him this revelation of himself. If you read the book of Revelation, that's, it says that in the very first line, the revelation of Jesus Christ. So don't fear the book. Don't get all perturbed about reading the book of Revelation. It's just a revelation of Jesus. It's a beautiful book. And so he sent John, I need you to listen. I need you to listen really well because I'm about to give you a download of something very powerful. And he says this verse, he says, He that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. As a matter of fact, as he goes through the book of Revelation, he says it seven times. Seven times over, he repeats this line to to John. He's saying, I, I need you to listen to this. And so he gives John this revelation of himself. This was John. This was the apostle. This was the beloved disciple who laid his head on the breast of Jesus. And now he's about to fall down dead like, like he's a dead person, such as the image that he's about to get in chapter one. He gets this image of, of, of this, this person with white hair showing time and righteousness and wisdom his eyes full of flame relating to his fire and passion in his soul his feet of bronze no clay in these feet it was a picture of strength what it was saying that was everything that was given to this image to carry he had the capacity to stand on bronze brass feet and carry it it was strength his voice was like the sound of many waters before we do another thing today we need to realize how great a savior we have he is a mighty god he is a mighty savior and it's interesting here because john uses old words he uses daniel's description he uses ezekiel's words he's describing jesus not as something new but as something fresh that's really important. Old Testament metaphors he's using to express a fresh expression of the one who's the same yesterday and today and forever, according to the book of Hebrews, the writer unknown to us. And it's important because one of the dangers of our time, one of the spirits of the age that I see and that I sense at the moment is that people are trying to create a new God. They're trying to create a God who fits into their mold, a God who will agree with the way they live, even though it's contrary to the word of God. Listen to me. Jesus did not die on the cross to make you comfortable. He died on the cross to usher in the kingdom. He didn't die on the cross to relate to the deviance of the way you want to live your life. He died on the cross to save the world. And so it's important that we grasp these truths. And what John's saying in the book of Revelation, he's pulling Old Testament imagery uh, to introduce us to a fresh manifestation and revelation of who Jesus is. And if there's one thing we want to do through this, um, this uh, um, theme of listen, we want to bring some of the elementary truths of old and present them to you in a fresh manner that you can see Jesus for who he really is. We're not making a new thing. We're just refreshing and bringing to you what's old yet ever new. Four times over uh, in other places in the, in the New Testament, he, he uses a little phrase, um, he that hears to hear, let him hear. Um, not, not without the little tagline at the end, what the Spirit sent to the church. So over and over again in the New Testament, you have this connotation and the very emphasis, listen, tune in, would imply that the opposite's true. It would imply that there's people not listening. It would imply that there's people not paying attention. And I again say, I think that's the Spirit of the age, listening to all the wrong voices. And so we hear today, all too common today, as people say, well, the Lord spoke to me, or I heard the Spirit say, or, or I have this feeling, or, or, or a fresh one today, as I sense that the Lord is. And I'm struck by these comments at the moment. I've been caught by them, and they, 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 pre they, they make us realize one thing, that God actually still speaks. 
Not against people saying that at all, because people hear God in all different ways. And speaking and hearing are two communication pieces. They're two communication means to speak is to say words, but to hear is to listen and to receive what's spoken by the mouth. And I've been pondering for some time what way God actually speaks today and how his children should hear. And to answer some of my questions, I want to read you a passage from the Old Testament in First. Samuel 3. In 1 Samuel 3, we have a boy called Samuel who his mom prayed hard and long for. And then she gave him back to the Lord to serve in the house of the Lord all the days of his life. And at this time in history, hearing from God was a rarity. It didn't happen very much. God was giving no visible signs of his presence. And so here we have it in the first verse of 1 Samuel 3, the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli, who was an old priest. And in those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. Why was that? Well, this time in Israel's history was one of despondency. It was one of hopelessness and despair. God is not speaking. God is silent. God's voice is quieted. Why? Because of Israel's sin. This is the, the days of Ichabod, the presence, the, the glory of God has departed from the house of God. These are dark days, but something different is observed in 1 Samuel 3. God rushes in. <clears throat> in a dark day, God rushes in eager to speak. Here's what happens. <clears throat> One night, Eli whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. And the lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord. Notice where he was lying, where the ark of God was, close to the presence. Good boy he is, isn't he? Then the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Eli said, I didn't call you. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again, the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. It's beautiful, isn't it? Such tenderness as God's grace comes, as the, the power of God is moving in this place. Samuel is awakened by the, 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 the voice of the Lord. And then he goes on and he says this. He says, my son, Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. He thinks Eli's calling him. He, three times in the narrative, Samuel appears before Eli saying, here I am, because he mistakes God's voice for a man's voice. He mistakes God's voice for his teacher's voice. Such is the, the beauty of the voice of God. You see how you could confuse it? You see how you could mix it up with other voices? This is the thing, you see. And so what happens is then Eli realizes, I love this, then Eli realizes that uh, the, the authorized version uses the word perceived, that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood there. Isn't that amazing? Not beautiful. This would imply that God is not thundering from heaven's throne. This would imply that God isn't calling from a distance. This would imply that God's moving to the door of Samuel's room. And he's standing at the door of his room and he's saying, Samuel, son, Samuel, listen to me. The beautiful thing is God comes in his grace and his tenderness. This is the God of Sinai. This is the God of revelation. This is the God who is awesome. And he comes and he stands and speaks to a boy. Just a child. Because his hand is upon him. I love this. I love this whole imagery of this, this proximity. He's close. Samuel said, speak for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, see, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears it about it tingle. Could it be we're living in a day that we need to listen so intently to the voice of God because he's about to do something that would make the ears of the people hear it tingle? Here he comes, he, 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 he takes 
uh, three times before Eli realizes that the Lord is speaking, but Eli does a teaching moment and he says to Samuel, listen, you, you need to go and lie down and if he calls you, verse 9, just say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Samuel's response should be ours, of course. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. And so he continues in this visitation with Samuel. He reveals to Samuel his future work to the nation. He, he reveals to him the mighty discipline that's going to happen in Eli's life, sad as it was. These are sobering words for an available servant to hear. But Samuel continues to be an obedient servant of the Lord. As a matter of fact, it goes on to tell us in verse 19 that the Lord was with Samuel as he grew up. And he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. So God still speaks today. That's what I want to say to you today. God still speaks. And we need to listen more intently than we ever have. We need to numb out some of the other voices. We need to numb out some of the evening news. We need to numb out some of the theorists the theories today that are flying about. We need to numb out some of the people who are creating division amongst us. We need to numb out some of those other voices and listen to God because the narrative gives me some questions about hearing the Lord and responding to his voice. And I believe with all my heart that God still speaks. And in the multiple means of how he speaks we're going to look at this morning and every believer should know his voice john 10 says my sheep hear my voice not read my word and i'm a man of the word i love this bible and i love the word but the bible says my sheep hear my voice and so what we want to do this morning is we want to look and see how can we hear the voice how can we hear that voice afresh now the two main ways that i think in scripture I'm sure there are many others. These are just my, I'm in your breath. These are just my, my simple thoughts, all right? My simple thoughts. I'm excited about this. I'm excited about listening to the voice of God. You see, I think that one of the ways is through general revelation. And that explains how God speaks through natural means like the stars and nature and sky and created things. And the Bible is full of verses such as Psalm 19 that tells us the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. We know all of this. Romans is another one in uh, Romans 1.20, for since creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, the eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. So the natural world declares the Lord. You've been in natural places of beauty. Some of the photographs firing up onto Facebook of, 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 of the lake um, down at the park and the swans and things, and we can go there and we can proclaim the beauty of God. If ever you've been in the morns, you've just got a climb sleeve binion. If you've never done it in your life, go and do it. Time slave Binion and stand at the top of Binion and look at the size of the stones. There's stones at the top of Binion that are larger than your car, some of them the size of your house. And you stand on the top and you look at those stones and you think, how did they get there? And you say, surely there is a God in heaven. Surely there is a God with a creative imagination that could say, let there be stones on the top of Binion. There is something so powerful about this. Charles Spurgeon was noted to have put it this way. He says, God seems to talk to me in every primrose and daisy and smiles at me from every star and whispers to me in every breath of morning air and calls aloud to me in every storm. Nature profoundly speaks of God and draws our hearts to the amazing truth of the gospel. But there's another way that God speaks. And I, through... He speaks through general um, revelation, but I think this is a very powerful way. He speaks through scriptural revelation. This is the way God explains uh, experientially and exactly. Now, I say experientially because there are some unique means through which God speaks through scripture that are not necessarily maybe common occurrences today, um, even though they may still happen. And we have the Scripture complete, the Bible. This is the full, completed Word of God. And so there, God speaks through His Word. And so we, uh, when we studied Hebrews on the morning devotions, we, we looked at this verse, how in times past God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times in various ways. But in these last days, He has spoken by His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, and through whom also He made the universe. What's he saying through that? Well, you see, he's speaking through his son. 
Jesus. And in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. The same was in the beginning with God. Jesus is the living Word. This is a hymn book. This is all about Him. Now, I'm not saying that God doesn't speak other ways, because we're going to talk about that in weeks ahead, because God can speak any way He wants. I always say God can use the dog next door if He so decides to do so. He's used a donkey in the Bible. He spoke through all kinds of different mediums, so God can do it. But this becomes our rudder. This becomes our rudder. This becomes the means by which we test everything because it is the Word of God. So if somebody gives you a prophetic word, and I'm all open to that, and I love the voice of the prophet, and we need to rise it up stronger, but it needs to be calculated by the rudder. All right? So if if he tells you something that's contrary to the Word, you need to rip it up and put it in the bin. Because he will never tell you anything that's contrary to the Word. And so there are many experiential ways that God spoke through the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And this isn't an an exhaustive list. But he spoke through angels. He spoke through angels um, to Abraham, to to Peter in the New Testament. God, Peter, out of prison, came and ministered to Jesus in the wilderness. Came and ministered to Jesus in Gethsemane. So angels are very powerful. Very powerful. And I love the ministry of angels. I think they're still important today. Again, we've got to test it by the rudder. All right? The prophets and teachers. So in the Old Testament, you had all the prophets who were called to communicate God's warning of sin and, 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 and call people to repent. And they, they pointed the audience to see their sin and, and to seek God's deliverance. Like, so people like Samuel. So in 1 Samuel 2.35, I think the verse is, it talks about how God raised up Samuel as a faithful priest. He raises him up as a faithful priest to serve in the house of God. God uses dreams and visions, all right, to communicate special calling. He did this in the Old Testament with a man called Joseph, and you can read 13 chapters on the life of Joseph from Genesis 37 right through to 50. Um, This whole idea of dreams and visions, visions were used by Daniel um, when he went before Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4. And then we've got fire and unusual images, which were also frequent visitors in the Bible. Moses came to the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. And of course, we have another fire scene in Scripture in 1 Kings 19, when fire comes down from heaven uh, as an answer to Elijah's prayer when he was fighting against the prophets of Baal. So God uses many mediums in many ways to communicate to his people, and he has done all down through the ages. And Dave mentioned Nicodemus. He met this man in John 3, and he calls Nicodemus, and he said, Marvel not! Don't be surprised. There's something new about to happen in your life. You must be born again. And we're going to talk a wee bit about that over the next few weeks as well. So he's calling them into the gospel way of living. Outpouring of languages. Acts 2, 4, multiple languages. It's another beautiful way that God speaks in the New Testament. But you may be asking, what about today? What about now? How does God speak to me? How should I hear him? Well, let me suggest to you seven practical ways, and we have 10 minutes to do it, and we'll do it, no bother, all right? Seven ways. If you're taking notes, good thing to do. Um, these are just practical ways. They're not, it's not an exhaustive list, but I think it might help you. Number one, <clears throat> reading the Bible. <laughs> reading the Bible. Basic. The devotional practice of reading and absorbing the Scriptures, resulting in memorizing it, reading, reciting, responding with an intention to a renewed spiritual growth. That's what GROW is all about tomorrow night. How do you gain spiritual muscle? Will you get it this way? Whoever looks intently, James says, into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues into not forgetting what they've heard and doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So there's a blessing in this. There's even a blessing. If you read the, 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 the first little part of, of Revelation, you'll find, blessed is the one who reads aloud. Hear that? Reads aloud, not into yourself. Um, read it aloud. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in, for the time is near. You can read the book of Revelation, by the way, in 45 minutes. All right, my time, in, and I'm not a fast reader. 45 minutes. There's a wee job for you this afternoon. Okay? So read the scriptures. Second way is through meditation. 
The <clears throat> new age have stolen this very means. The world has stolen this from the church, all right? Meditation is the practice of hearing God's voice through Scripture, training the mind to apprehend and the willingness to respond in obedience to the revelation given um, to the person through active memorization of the Word. So you're up in the mountains and... and um, the guys, my brother Kenny gives off to me for doing this, walk in a puddle, and I go, I sink in the deep mire where there is no standing. And Kenny says to me, Phil, you have to have a verse for everything. <laughs> well, it's meditation, you see. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates it, who allows it to get into their heart and into their mind, allows it, you see, you see, the, the, we say sometimes the truth will set you free. That's not true. That's not true. It says you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. It's just a book. If it's not in your head and not in your heart, it's just a book. And so you've got to get it inside you. You've got to meditate on it day and night. We better keep going. Number three, number three, prayer. The practice of coming before God, speaking and having a conversation so that we and others may benefit the divine provision of God, receive measures of grace in order that needs will be met and hearts awakened to God's presence. It's a two-way thing. We talk to him, he speaks to us. Let us approach then the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and grace to help us in a time of need, Hebrews 4. Number four, journaling. Journaling, the practice of writing personal thoughts, remembrances, reflections, experiences, concerns, and meditative responses to the Word of God in the Spirit. You see, God speaks to me in dreams, all right? Some pe I used to think it was cool to somebody said to me, Phil, you think that maybe you just can't get your attention when you're awake. And that's maybe true. But He speaks to me in dreams, so I need to keep a journal by my bed. So I need to write down this. This is what he said to Jeremiah. Write it in a book. All the words that I've spoken to you. He said to Habakkuk and Habakkuk too. Write the vision down. Make sure it's plain. Make sure you write it down. If you don't write it down, you will forget it. All right. Number five, fasting. The practice of temporarily abstaining from certain appetites such as food or entertainment for the purpose of sacrifice in order to concentrate fully on spiritual truths. Listen to me. God doesn't hear you better if you're hungry. All right? If you're just doing it because you think you're going to get God's attention, there's an act of fasting. Jesus said in Matthew 6, when you fast, not if you fast. He just took it for granted that as Children of God, disciples, we would fast. And fast is abstaining from certain things to concentrate, to give your mind focus, to give that time and focus to God um, to, to work through um, certain issues. So that's really important. Don't do it like the hypocrites did it. Number six, Sabbath rest. Oh, we don't talk about this one enough. Sure we don't. Hebrews talks about entering into a, a rest Entering into a rest that God gives. This is a period of resting from one's labor that's commanded in places like Exodus 31, we see this, and using that time for worship and for sleep and reflection on God's sovereign work of creation. I remember back a number of years ago at the start of church, and I was a full-time job, and I was full-time job, and full-time church, and full-time parent, and all of the things that were going on, and I felt God tell me to take three days and set aside three days for him and, and just go away from work and go away from everything and take three days. I slept the first whole day. I felt guilty. I, I lay down, to, got down on my knees to pray. I fell fast asleep. Slept for two hours on my knees. Got up and got onto the chair and thought, okay, God, sorry about that. God, we better get back into gear. And God started to pray. Ten minutes later, I was sleeping again. Slept the whole day. I began to realize that God was actually drawing me into a rest. He was drawing me into a time where I would get recharged. So we need to understand rest. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. It's a promise of Scripture. Take my yoke upon me. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. And then listen to this. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. If you're carrying a heavy yoke or you're pulling a heavy burden today, it's not God. For his yoke's easy, his burden's light. Number seven. We've done well, didn't we? 
Number seven, pursuing God's presence. The practice of experience and recognizing God through his invisible presence and the provision of all of life. Acknowledging his control over every facet as one who endeavors to live and work on earth. So he's the God of your work. He's the God of your family. If it's out of control, it's not out of his control. He is in full control. And here's the truth. The word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of his one and only someone who came from the Father full of grace and truth here for us today like Samuel standing at your door standing at the, at the, at the door of your life saying Jim, John, Maggie, Robbie all have come with me come with me listen to his voice his voice is here because and what should our response to be well there's a couple of things a couple of things that we close off with our response is two things Firstly, we must never miss God when he speaks. We must never miss God when he speaks. And there's reasons why we do. One is rebellion. Our ears are dull because we don't perceive the glorious gospel of God and sin comes in. And I can miss God if I've got a rebellious heart. Part of hearing God is, is fruit bearing. John 14, we haven't time to talk about that, but God's power um, allows spiritual truths and fruit to work, work in my life. And one of the other reasons that we can miss God's voice is just through busyness, lack of capacity to receive what God's saying. Like it's no secret here that we've had internet problems here in church. And um, uh, especially when everybody's in the building, internet has crashed sometimes on us. And what happens when the internet crashes is somebody will say to me, Phil, I sent you an email, and I'll open the email. I get my phone and open the email, and the email's there. I see I've got an email from Dave, but it says in the box, no content. And, and, and the problem is, the problem is I got the email. I know I've got an email from Dave, but I don't have the capacity to download it. There's no room, the, the, the thing's too full, so there's no capacity to download it. And this is what happens in our lives. We get busy and we get the messages. We see God speaking. We've got the word, but there's no content because we don't have the capacity to download what God sent to us. Folks, you've got to create some capacity. You've got to create some margins in your life. You never miss God's life. And secondly, always be a teacher. Be an Eli. I know his eyes were dim, but he, he caught it on eventually. Go and lie down, and if he speaks again, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. I felt God speak to me this week, and I felt God say this to me out of Revelation. I know this is for me, but I'm sharing it, all right? Repent and do the works you did at first. He sent it to the church at Ephesus because they lost their first love. They lost the vision of what they really should be doing. And they got tied into all other things. And there came a moment where he said, if you're going to get this right, you've got to repent and do what I called you to do at first. Folks, don't believe the lie. I've told you this story before, and I finish with it. One day, two twins stood at the side of a river. One was called Truth, and one was called Lies. And uh, Lie challenged Truth to a race, claiming he would swim across the river faster than Truth. So Lie laid out the rules to the challenge, stayed in the booth, remove all their clothes, and at the count of three, dive into the freezing cold water, swim to the other side and back. Lie counted to three, and when Truth jumped in, Lie didn't. Truth swam across the river, but Lie put on Truth's clothes and walked back into town dressed as Truth. He proudly paraded around town pretending to be Truth. Truth made it back to the shore, but his clothes were all gone, and he was left naked with only Lie's clothes to wear. So he refused to dress himself as a lie and walked back into town naked. People stared and glared at naked truth as it walked around the town. He tried to explain what happened, and the fact he was actually really truth, but because he was naked and uncomfortable to look at, people mocked and shunned him. Refusing to really believe he was truth, the people in town chose to believe lie because he was dressed appropriately and easier to look at. And from that day to this, people have come to believe a lie rather than believe the naked truth. And there's something about the truth of God at the moment 
God is speaking. And we need to tune our eyes to listen. Because if we don't, we miss what he says. So, shh. Give yourself some time this afternoon just to listen. Just to listen. Zip their lip and just listen. Father, I pray that your voice will be heard across this room. I pray, God, as a people sit to listen to what you're saying, no matter what's going on in life, that your voice will be here, heard loud and clear. In Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast. For more information about our church and all that we do, please visit our website at emmanuel-church.co.uk. We hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast. For more information about our church and all that we do, please visit our website at emmanuel-church.co.uk.